Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the first of our Law and Nature Dialogue webinar series for session two, 2021. Um, today, we have Professor Holly Doremus from the University of California, Berkeley, to speak on the topic of conservation equity. Before we begin, I'll just uh, bring everyone uh, sort of up to speed with the um, profile, the, the amazing profile of uh, Professor Holly Doremus and some uh, brief notes on what she will be talking to us about today. So uh, Holly Doremus is the James H. House and Hiram H. Hurd Professor of Environmental Regulation at the University of California, Berkeley, and the co-director of the Law of the Sea Institute and co-faculty director of the UC Berkeley Institute for Parks, People and Biodiversity. Professor Doremus is an elected fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and has been elected to the American Law Institute. She has served on three National Academy of Science expert review committees, as well as a number of other advisory committees and boards. Her scholarship focuses on biodiversity protection, the intersection between property rights and environmental regulation, and the interrelationship of environmental law and science. On a personal note, I have uh, extensively used and been inspired by uh, Holly's research over the years. In particular, one thing that has always resonated with me is the way in which uh, her uh, work has emphasized the importance of values in environmental law to try and dismiss the idea that environmental law is objective and instead reveal that environmental law in terms of its design, its implementation, its ethics uh, is all driven by, by values and understanding the role of values is absolutely critical to our analysis and evaluation of law. Today, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Professor Doremus will be talking to us about uh, conservation equity. Um, you have the abstract with you, so I won't say too much more uh, other than to say, um, again, conservation equity uh, appeals, I think, to the importance of values in terms of environmental law in, in implementation and application. Professor Doremus has said and will explain that decisions regarding uh, biodiversity and conservation are rarely based on careful and transparent exploration of principles of fairness and equity. Uh, her paper will uh, demonstrate the need for a more coherent and principled consideration of conservation equity is overdue, both because justice demands it and because its absence undermines the legitimacy of conservation measures. With that, I'll hand over to uh, Professor Doremus. Thank you, Paul, for that very kind, too kind introduction. And let me see if I can manage to share my screen. How does that look? Everybody see my PowerPoint there? Great, thank you. Okay, so as Paul said, I'm going to talk about conservation equity. This is a, um, it's a work in progress. It's, it's not uh, finished, not published. So I'm hoping I'll get some great feedback and ideas from you all on how to refine this before I send it out for uh, publication. Let's see if I can actually, there we go. So equity is a, uh, a principle, a set of ideas that have been recognized as important in some contexts in environmental law, and particularly in the context of pollution law. We've been talking about environmental justice for at least 30, I would say closer to 40 years now, I guess the mid eighties was when we started really explicitly talking about that in terms of the unequal impacts of pollution on different communities and the need to think about the fairness of distribution of uh, pollution impacts. And we started to talk about it more recently in terms of who has access to preserved areas, to natural areas. And for example, in California, um, our Coastal Commission has, is now making it a priority. Public beach access is a, um, 
it's an important actually legal right in California. And um, as a practical matter, our Coastal Commission is now has, is making it a priority to try to make that available, um, not just as a matter of law, but, but in reality to all the communities of California. So that's certainly one of the ways that we talk about equity in a conservation context is who gets, um, uh, who gets access to our conserved lands and on what kinds of terms. But I would argue that the equity implications of other kinds of conservation decisions are still very much hidden. And I'm going to use a, a set of examples specifically from the United States, because that's where I work, that's the, the law that I'm most familiar with. But I actually think that these concepts are pretty generalizable. I think these same sorts of issues are um, hidden or not sufficiently acknowledged in many other places as well. And from my perspective, um, having thought about uh, conservation law for, for longer than I care to admit at this point, um, we have fought endlessly and fiercely about acceptable thresholds for the use of nature as an economic extractable resource. Right, we fight a lot, and this is where we tend to focus on the science, the natural science of it. How much water do we need to leave in our streams? How much land do we need to conserve to keep species that we're interested in around? Um, how much wildlife can we harvest and still have sustainable populations, right? And that is a focus of a lot of political discussion, a lot of um, uh, work by a lot of different people. And we fight, I think, not as much as we should actually about what our conservation goals ought to be, and which obviously has to underpin this, these scientific issues of how much is enough. They're, these are difficult questions and they deserve serious attention. But so does equity, so do the allocation decisions. And we've, we have tended not to think much about the allocation decisions that are inherent. Um, when anytime we set a threshold, this much of nature can be exploited and the rest cannot. Some, somewhere we're gonna draw a box around what can be exploited and what cannot. Uh, we also have to make decisions about who gets to exploit the part that's on the table for uh, extractive use. And those, those questions, those decisions tend to be very much submerged and not publicly acknowledged, not explained, not tied to explicit principles. And as long as we do things that way, I think there are a couple of, of real issues. Um, people who are making those decisions are not accountable for them if they're not publicly admitted to. And so if we have a democratic political system where we rely on accountability to make sure that um, uh, our government actors are in fact doing what society uh, wants them to do, we don't have that kind of democratic accountability if the decisions are not acknowledged. And we don't have a discussion of what fairness actually requires. That's a difficult discussion to have, but if we don't have it at all, certain interests are actually going to be privileged. And those are likely to be the interests that are already winning in the status quo game, in the wealth game, in the access to political power game. And that actually might not be what we would prefer as a society, although it's certainly what those privileged people uh, would prefer. So I wanna talk about three sets of examples of allocation issues just to demonstrate, because I, I think at least in the United States, 
this is not at all talked about, that there are important distributional issues here. And when I raise this with colleagues and when I've circulated drafts of this, pa this paper, people are like, oh, I didn't think about that. So here are three examples from the water uh, rights, water extraction context, habitat development, and fish harvest. And I'll try to go through these pretty quickly so that we can get to the more interesting sort of discussion points that they that they raise. So water use, this is a picture of irrigated agriculture from a place in Northern California called the Scott Valley, uh, where my husband and I drive through a lot. We actually have a, a weekend place, a, a cabin up in this area. And as you can see, this is, a, this is a place that's naturally very dry. There isn't agriculture unless it's irrigated. Uh, even the, the um, uh, livestock pastures. Well, there are some places where livestock are put out on the, uh, the natural non-irrigated uh, landscape uh, at certain times of the year. Other, other times pasture is irrigated. This is an alfalfa field uh, growing forage for uh, livestock. And um, this is really important to the stakeholders the farmers care a lot about how much water they have access to, because this is actually a pretty difficult place to farm. It's high and cold and short growing seasons, and it's very dry. Um, so farmers can't make a living there unless they have access to irrigated water. But there are other stakeholders as well. And in particular, in this part of California and Oregon, there are the uh, Klamath tribes, and also other tribes downstream who have cultural ties to fish that live in uh, lakes and rivers in this area. And if the farmers get all the water, the fish don't, that's a problem for uh, those tribes and for their ability to maintain their uh, heritage. Now, in the, the Western United States, we have a system of appropriative rights, which if you talk to people, if you just read the law, you would think that's determined everything. In fact, there are never allocation questions because in our dry landscapes, the waters are all allocated and we have perpetual water rights. Once you get a water right in our Western states, it does not expire. It's there forever. So if we have this situation where seniority rules, then the senior water rights uh, get their water even in time of drought, the junior water rights do not, that decision has been made, we might think. There are no more, allocate, uh, no more distributional decisions to be made, but it turns out that's not true. There actually is a lot of distributive discretion available. And where we're seeing that right now is in the context of drought response. This is this week's version of the US drought monitor. You can see it does not look good. The, the uh, maroon color there, the very dark uh, red, that is exceptional drought. And you can see how much of the West, how much of California uh, that's covering, right? We're in a really bad drought right now. And that means there's not enough water available for all the uses people are used to making of it. So in dealing with drought, we have to tell people, oh, you're not gonna get your ordinary water. And we, at least in California, are now at the point of admitting that this is our new normal, hopefully not exactly this, but something closer to this, uh, a lot less water than we are used to having. And so we're gonna have to make some long-term decisions about who gets what. And these are just some recent headlines, New York Times, the United States has declared shortage on the Colorado River, which is one of that, that's the river that feeds the inner mountain west, the, the inland west and the Rocky Mountains and just a little tiny piece in California. Water cuts are required and everybody believes deeper ones are gonna be required going forward. And it's not exactly clear how those will be made. For this year, the water cuts were made by agreement of the lower uh, Colorado Basin states. And this is another uh, headline, um, drought rules spark accusations of racism in California outposts. This actually, uh, this story comes from 
the uh, from Siskiyou County, which is where I showed you that picture, that Scott uh, Scott Valley uh, picture was. The county has made rules about use of wells this year that are prohibiting use for marijuana cultivation, which from the county's perspective is because marijuana cultivation is not legal in Siskiyou County. It's, it's legal in California, subject to local control. And Siskiyou County has said, no, we don't want dope growing here. So they would say, well, we're just saying you can't make an illegal uh, use of water. But it turns out that the marijuana grown, growers in Siskiyou County are systematically Hmong, uh, Hmong American uh, community. And they are, uh, most of Siskiyou County is, Siskiyou County is overwhelmingly white. Uh, but this is like the biggest uh, subgroup that's not white, these Hmong Americans, and they believe they're targeted because of their race, and they're being denied water for more than marijuana use as, as marijuana growing. As a practical matter, they're being told they can't bring water to their homes uh, in this very dry uh, area where their wells are not necessarily working. And in practice, actually, there is a surprising amount of distributive discretion, which is only sometimes acknowledged. And just a few examples, um, we can lump together tiers of users instead of going one by one by one as the seniority system would suggest. California has just curtailed uh, water use by uh, essentially everybody in the Sacramento uh, River watershed. The Sacramento San Joaquin is our main river system. and um, essentially all water rights, water use is being cut back. Uh, they're not, not trying to find who's the most senior who can still use their water. In the context of drought, we have emergency regulations which don't have to follow the appropriative rights system. And a couple of, in our last drought, Governor Brown basically said, you can't water your lawn, no matter how senior your uh, municipal water system is can't have that. And they didn't cut farmers, uh, interestingly. Appropriate water uh, rights only allow reasonable use. They don't allow waste. And that may allow some reconsideration, right? And California is now thinking about what might be defined as waste in the context of a drought. Groundwater management is new in California. And so there's a new set of groundwater plans that they're sort of connected to the surface water stuff, but um, who can use what groundwater is now being regulated for the first time. And there's a lot of discretion there. And there's a lot of looking for voluntary agreements where users in a watershed are being encouraged to get together and decide amongst themselves who can cut, not necessarily on the basis of uh, seniority. Habitat development is another context where there are necessarily distributive allocation decisions, but they're not always acknowledged or even uh, really recognized. Think about things like, again, these are just US, some US species. Uh, the gray wolf used to range across two thirds of the United States. That's the dark gray area there. Um, where it is now, is much smaller areas, the sort of light orange and the dark brown is where uh, this particular group of scientists think there is good potential habitat. But it's not the case that we're gonna protect all that habitat or we're gonna protect wolves in all of it. And indeed, we are only protecting wolves in a very small portion even of their uh, current range right now. But there's never been any talk about what's fair. Sometimes in the politics of it, there have been complaints when wolves were reintroduced in the Northern Rockies, there were complaints that, oh, those people in Denver, we should put wolves there because they would hate it. And they're the liberal, you know, pro-wildlife uh, people, uh, unrealistic people who are imposing them on us. Um, but that, that's certainly not the way these decisions have been made. Wolves, gray wolves, of course, are a charismatic species. This is the exact opposite. This is a conservancy fairy shrimp. It's about this big. It's a tiny little thing uh, that lives in vernal pools in the west, uh, in the west coast. And its range 
this particular one is pretty much throughout California, at least in the, in the places where vernal pools occur. What I've shown on the right here is a partial map of um, what's been declared the critical habitat. And that's not at the same scale, so it's a little bit hard to compare, but this would be a piece of what's up here. So some of that we've decided we're gonna protect a little bit more, but not a lot. How did we decide? Well, we pretended that was all about science, uh, but in fact, we know it's not. And even within these areas that are uh, designated as critical habitat, our uh, wildlife agencies have decided that some of that, some pieces of those can be lost without telling us how they'll decide uh, which. Just another example that everywhere, you know, even species with the much smaller ranges, we have to decide what we're gonna protect and what we're not of their habitat. And that's tricky in places where we have uh, urban development. So not all habitat needs to be protected. We're not in fact willing to protect all habitat, but there are no clear principles for choosing among potential protected sites, which has implications for the species. There may be some sites that are better for the species than others. Certainly also has implications for the owners and users of land some of whom are told, yeah, you get to develop your property. Others are told, nope, not you. And then the third example is uh, fisheries and deciding who gets to catch what of the allowable catch, who gets to do that. And in the United States, we make those decisions um, at the federal level through our fisheries law, the Magnuson-Stevens Act, this one explicitly mentions equity. Unlike those other contexts where the, relevant, the, the uh, relevant law does not use the word equity or fairness, uh, the Magnuson-Stevens Act does. One of the national standards that all federal fisheries management plans must comply with is that if we have to allocate among US fisher fishers, we would probably say now, uh, fishermen in the 1970s, um, we have to do so in a way that is fair and equitable. Note that's only US fishers. We're reserving uh, our, our fisheries to the extent possible for our nationals. That's not unusual around the world. We don't think we have to be fair to anybody except uh, US fishers, but there we do say we have to be fair. And Allocations also have to be calculated to promote conservation, which is actually kind of strange when you think about it, that the allocation decision, the distribution decision has to be calculated to promote conservation. And this turns out to be quite problematic that we should not say things like that about allocation uh, decisions and no one should get an excessive share. Uh, the fisheries agency, the National Marine Fisheries Service has um, by regulation, given us a little more information, uh, but not much. What they've said is again, looking at this idea that they have to promote conservation, they have to be rationally connected. Allocation decisions have to be rationally connected to other objectives of fisheries management. And to the extent there's any um, attempt to flesh out what equity means, it really looks like net social utility which I wouldn't have thought of as an equitable distribution principle, actually. Uh, but to, you can impose hardship on one group if it's outweighed by the total benefits received by another group. Well, that means achieve net utility, but it doesn't tell us which groups get to lose and which groups get to win and how that kind of determination ought to be made. And in fact, those determinations are made on a very ad hoc basis by the um, uh, fisheries management councils. Those must represent uh, participants in the fishery. So there's some process protection for the people we might consider the stakeholders, um, but not, not necessarily on any um, overarching way. Uh, you know, we don't really look at exactly what part of the fishery do you represent and 
uh, uh, how long have you been in it, so forth. And sometimes the outcomes in the courts are pretty curious. So there's a recent case, this ground fish forum case, which says that uh, in an Alaska fishery, catch could not be allocated explicitly to vessels that use shore-based uh, processing. Now, why is that an equity issue? Because in Alaska, fishing communities, some of these shore-based communities are really uh, dependent on fishing for economic input. It's almost the only economic input some of these places have, right? But the fishery management plan couldn't say some of the catch has to be allocated there uh, because that wasn't, it, it wasn't clear how that helped conservation overall. It was just an allocation decision, a social choice. And the court said that ah, the Magnuson Act doesn't permit that. Okay, so I have managed to run through that very quickly. I still have plenty of time left, which means we'll still have, we'll have plenty of time for questions and uh, discussion. And I can go back to any of those um, slides or talk in more detail about those contexts if you'd like. But here's the meat of um, what, what I want you to think about and to, to help me think about. Two clear lessons from my uh, perspective. One is that allocation decisions are an inherent part of conservation policy. That anytime, you know, we, we focus on the thresholds because we're thinking about how do we achieve our conservation goals. And yeah, the allocation piece isn't directly about achieving our conservation goals. It's about achieving other societal goals, although I think it matters to the conservation uh, piece because those allocation decisions matter tremendously to the stakeholders. Winners and losers care a lot about who gets to develop land, who gets to take water out of streams, who gets to harvest fish, whatever other conservation context you want to think about. And if those decisions are hidden, or in some contexts, we deny that we're making them at all. In the, in the water context, for example, I made those decisions 150 uh, years ago, and we're done with them. Um, or, or we make them on an ad hoc basis, in the fisheries context, the agencies actually do, they have to talk about equity. They have to say, here's what we think is the equitable allocation, but they don't have to say, here's how we define equity. And here are the principles that we're applying. And they don't, you know, if you go read these uh, fishery management plans, they don't say that. Now, sometimes we'll say things like, uh, here are other ways we could have made this decision. In fact, they're, they're, they are by regulation required to do so, to say, <clears throat> here's what else we thought about. And that may give you some idea of their view of fairness, uh, but they don't have to say, here's our principles for fairness and here's how this decision lives up to those principles. I understand that because actually this is a really good analogy, I think, to the situations in which uh, we talk only about the science and not about the values inherent in our conservation goals. Because we prefer, at least in the United States, in, in our political discussions, we find it very hard to argue with one another about values. And so we pretend we don't have to. And we look for ways not to have to. And to try to say, look, this is an objective decision, right? Now, allocation decisions inherently cannot be objective unless you have a decision rule, an algorithm that you've come up with in some non-objective way, and then you just apply it uh, in a machine-like manner to your uh, decisions. 
Um, so these decisions really are not objective, but we're uncomfortable talking about uh, how they're made. And then it makes people unhappy if they lose value arguments. They're understandably unhappy about that. On the other hand, I think like submerging values underneath a science charade or a science veneer, I think the risks are kind of similar here. Uh, there's a risk that we'll make a mistake about values that are actually pretty important. I mean, I think actually fairness matters. It matters to most of us. We have very different views about what fairness is, but we want decisions to be fair. And if we don't, if we aren't honest about how we're looking at fairness, if we try not to talk about it, then we really might make a decision that's wrong, that's inconsistent with society's views of fairness. And you know, we've seen in the last couple of years here in the US for sure, our views of fairness have changed, or at least some ideas about fairness have been surfaced that, that really were not talked about a lot before. And those kinds of ideas ought to be talked about in the conservation allocation context. I also think not talking about how we've arrived at a decision that the decision maker is prepared to defend as fair, submerging that discussion can undermine perceived legitimacy. And yes, it's hard to talk about fairness and to tell people, yeah, your view of fairness, we understand where that's coming from, but it's not gonna control that decision. But at least then they know that their view of fairness has been heard. And that should help with legitimacy. And I think that helps a bit with the robustness of the threshold decisions over time. Because if people don't feel they've been treated fairly in the allocation context, they'll keep pushing for more and more allocations. And that makes holding the line at, at a threshold difficult. So how can we move forward? Well, I absolutely admit that this is hard. This is not a set of easy questions. And indeed, I think that's one of the reasons why we haven't confronted it more uh, openly. Equity is really difficult to define. It's really difficult to agree on. Now, maybe this is a dodge for purposes of my paper. It certainly helps me uh, get, to the, get to an end point that I think is useful in this paper. I actually don't think that I have to decide what equity means for purposes of this paper. Um, I, indeed, I don't think there's a single definition that's correct or universally applicable in these situations. I think, I actually think it's enough for this paper to say that it's important to openly acknowledge and debate and determine what's equitable in this context according to principles the decision maker is willing to own and to own openly. Because at least that makes the decision maker accountable and if others disagree, that's a place to start this conversation. But I think we can go a little bit farther than that, and I'm willing to go a little bit farther than that. I would say that um, the kinds of hidden and ad hoc decisions that we've been making are made according to some principles. There are underlying principles that guide those decisions, but they're, they're probably, I mean, I said perhaps in the slide, I think they are probably not ones we would choose if we had to own the principles that we were uh, using. And two of the most common principles that are used, I think are, are illustrated by the uh, examples that I've given. The water rights situation in, in, the, in the Western US is all about protecting the status quo and saying people who have don't have to give up. People who have had for longer don't have to give up uh, until later on, until things are more dire. So that also is the sort of first come first served idea. 
And that's totally how we've allocated uh, habitat development. We've said in, in the, under the Endangered Species Act and also where we have um, place specific development restrictions, um, the Lake Tahoe Basin at the, at the boundary of uh, California and Nevada is governed by an interstate compact dealing with um, uh, development that is supposed to maintain the um, uh, clarity of Lake Tahoe. Lake, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Lake Tahoe. It's a very deep, clear uh, lake. Um, it, the, the watershed is almost all granite, so there's very few nutrients that come in. And so historically, it's this amazingly clear and therefore blue uh, lake. And that's something that the states of Nevada and California have agreed to um, have agreed to protect. But it's not that all development is prohibited. It's that they've tried to set thresholds. And how do they decide who gets to develop within those thresholds? Well, whoever comes and asks first. Right. And that's, there are, you know, those are both very common intuitions that the status quo matters, partly because people are invested in it partly because it's just there and we don't often question it. And that first come first served is a fair way to allocate re limited resources, right? But that's only true, uh, both of those are really only true if the starting distribution is fair and was fairly established. And if everyone has the same opportunity to get in line. And in fact, we know that neither of those is true. Certainly not in the Western United States, um, not in much of the, uh, the world. Even in the fisheries context, I think one of the, the lessons that we can learn is that even when we acknowledge fairness, if we're making these decisions on an ad hoc basis, the principles are likely to be pretty limited and not well considered. And these fisheries decisions are made by, um, a, there's eight regional fishery management councils and they make different decisions for every plan and they think about fairness differently. They, they've never sat down and, and thought sort of systematically what does fairness mean in this context. And so it ends up being this very seat of the pants, um, what's fair and actually status quo bias ends up being really, really common. Uh, even though in the fisheries context, it's different than water, we can reallocate harvest every year. No one has a, um, a perpetual right to a certain level of the, a certain piece of the available harvest. But these decisions are often based on historic participation in the fishery, status quo uh, bias, and on utilitarian framing. You know, this idea that what makes for net social welfare, uh, highest net social welfare, that's what's fair. Well, maybe that achieves the highest amount of welfare for society overall, but is it fair to the people within society? Not necessarily, but that's how we end up uh, looking at our uh, ad hoc decisions. So can we do better? You know, one, one question that's always fair to ask, in, in my mind at least, is, is the game worth the candle? Policy change, policy discussions are time and resource intensive and can create bad feeling where that didn't need to be the case, right? They, they can make the situation worse if we argue about things that ultimately don't make that much difference. That's contestable. People might disagree about whether this particular game is worth the candle. I think it is because uh, it, so, it has so limited our view of what's fair and it has so privileged the connected and the well-resourced and I'd like to see that change. So who can help it change and on what basis? Well, um, legislatures can do it. They could say in legislation that um, either they could limit allocation discretion or they could say 
set up a process that requires it to be uh, done more openly and with clearer consideration of equity consequences. Um, administrative agencies can do this as well, either uh, case by case if they choose to do so or through uh, general regulations. Maybe courts can do it. I actually think this is not a task that's very well suited to courts. And I think the experience here, uh, at least to US courts, the experience under the Magnuson Act suggests that if the legislation doesn't do a good job, courts are not a great place to intervene. And they may not have a great sense of uh, societal views of fairness. So does the indeterminacy of equity undermine any attempt to do this? I actually don't think so. I think there are probably some consensus principles that could be uh, uh, pretty generally applied. If everybody agrees and if everybody to whom the decision matters is a part of the decision, has an opportunity to be there, then it's hard to argue that that's not fair. Where we have voluntary agreements that incorporate all the relevant stakeholders, that's fair, sort of by definition. And um, that is the way we've done some things in the water context, and we're looking to do that. But we need to be careful about including all the stakeholders. And we need to be careful that requiring consensus doesn't end up allowing blockades by those who uh, uh, benefit from the status quo. And in other situations, I think the choice of principles is a political one, but accountability is necessary to allow the political process to keep it honest. And the, if we are explicit about our principles, I think that helps them give room, it helps give them room to evolve and change as societal values evolve over time. So I think I've only taken just a little bit more of the, the time that was expected. And I would love to hear your questions and comments. Oh, sorry about that, I'm mute. Uh, thanks so much, Holly, for the presentation. Um, brilliant, um, really such a, innovative and, and topical application of the idea and you know which has been running through I think different strands of environmental legislature for a while. Um, now we'll open up the water questions um, so please um, if you would like to ask Holly a question just raise your hand using the um, uh, reactions tab in Zoom. Um, alternatively you can uh, try and enter your questions into the chat box. Um, now I think we already have a question in the chat box there from uh, Johnson Chong. Um, so Holly, can you can you see the question or would you like me I to can. read it out? I okay. can see the question. So um, the, the question is, yeah, equity is uh, useful and important, but also limited uh, because it tends to be discussed in the context of equity between two contemporaneous human categories. And so what about equity between current and future generations of humans, equity between species? Do we need something completely different to talk about that, such as earth jurisprudence uh, uh, or uh, wild law? This is a, it's a, it's a fair question and I appreciate it. Um, equity, but actually, I think, I think equity, fairness can incorporate all of these sorts of ideas. Certainly, we talk about fairness between uh, intergenerational fairness a lot. There's no reason to say we can't think about that. And actually, I think that is incorporated sort of in a backhanded way. And I appreciate the reference to it. It's, it's incorporated in a kind of backhanded way in our uh, fisheries management goals, where we want our fisheries to be sustainable. That's the ch that choice of goal is about uh, achieving intergenerational uh, equity. But there might be more to it than that. And certainly we could talk about that in particular contexts. We could talk about uh, reserving some development opportunities. You know, one of the things, this is, this is hard to do in the United States 
because we hate planning. <laughs> Actually, we do it. We do land use planning, regional planning, that sort of thing. Um, but we're really suspicious of it. We think that's something that, you know, communists might prefer to do, but we're, we're not sure that's a good idea. But certainly any kind of planning that reserves some temporal, some future opportunities. If we think there's a threshold and there are decisions that are gonna be made for all time, like many development uh, decisions, that some of those ought to be held off. I think that's hard to do, but if we talk about intergenerational equity, actually maybe that makes it easier because I think that's a kind of fairness that has a lot of intuitive appeal. Right. And if we talk about it, I think we're actually more likely to get there. Equity between species. Again, I think that's something that we could talk about. Now, I think we'll need more than saying, well, this could be a part of equity. You know, if, if we have a process where equity has to be openly discussed, then presumably people have the opportunity to, to uh, uh, address that process and to say, well, what about equity with other species? Now, if society doesn't think of that as an important kind of equity, it won't win in the political context. So I think we need a lot of other tools to get other species uh, similar treatment. I guess I tend to think the rhetorical and political tools have to, be, have to come before any legal tools will be adopted or effective. But thanks very much for that question. Okay, um, there's another question or more of a comment in the um, chat there from Gil Boehringer um, about stakeholders being a loaded phrase. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's not quite phrased as a question, Holly. I don't know if you want to speak to that yeah. one from Gil. No, I, I think that's absolutely fair. And, and I tried to address this, I guess not, not in as clear a way as I should have when I said that it matters that all the people who uh, have a reason to, to care are included. Um, and yes, all stakeholders are not equal for sure. And if we're talking about uh, crafting stakeholder participation um, uh, uh, processes, we need to take into account lack of capacity and that sort of thing. I actually think there are some contexts where the stakeholders can be identified and can negotiate on a relatively um, even playing field. And I'm thinking about where California is trying to do this now. I, I have some problems with the way it's being done, but um, where we need to reduce water use in the Sacramento San Joaquin uh, watershed, for example, our major watershed. Um, and there are some tributaries there where we need to reduce water use in order to um, keep salmon around. And the, the regulatory agencies have tried very hard to provide incentives for the water users on those tributaries to negotiate with each other about who should take the hit. That, I think, is a context where if the agency has set the threshold in a way that we think is viable, it's never going to be perfect, then the distributional who takes the pain of that, that decision can be worked out with the stakeholders being the current users. And if we can provide them with incentives, to negotiate among themselves. It turns out that some of them are be better able to take the hit than others. And those are the way, these are the ways that I think markets can work appropriately. Now it has to be, there, there, there need to be sidebars there, uh, but, but sometimes at least I think this can work. Thanks, Holly. Gil, I can see you on the, um, I can yeah. see your video there. Did you want to respond, Gil, at all? Did you have any, any, any well, follow-up? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, 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 I take Holly's point, um, but I think it's a small one, uh, actually. 
Um, in most cases, our experience here, um, mm. well, I, I can't speak for Australia, but um, along the Darling River Basin, which is, mm -hmm. you know, it's sort of like the Mississippi and Missouri, it's, it's yep. the big one. Um, and in, I've been involved in a citizen's inquiry into that, and uh, the, the situation is dreadful, uh, yeah. of course. And I say, of course, because it's, you know, it's run by the government and corporations, too much water is taken out of the river. Big mm -hmm. surprise that, you know, there's illness, uh, lack of biodiversity, everything you want to mention. The yeah. government wants to build more dams. And they're always saying stakeholders. I mean, I just really hate that word, right. quite honestly. Right. And I, I think we have to be careful of language and, and, and getting used to normalizing uh, governmental expressions, uh, which cover up a whole range of contradictions, issues, problems, and so forth. Um, yeah. And whenever we, whenever we, we attempt to question or challenge uh, what the government has done, like building more dams. They always say, well, you know, we've, we've, we've had uh, participation, we've gotten all the stakeholders right. together, you know, and they're talking about huge corporations who want more water for irrigation mm -hmm. in the, you know, the driest continent in the world, perhaps. They, they're growing right. cotton, almonds, and various things that just suck up yeah. the water, steal it, lie about what they're doing you know it's 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 awful and those people yeah. are up against the first nations people yes you know? yes so I, typically, I would say, typically I, I, as you would appreciate yes you know? yes and i i would say two things about that one the well three things one uh the terms your context may make the stakeholder term more loaded than ours actually i think uh, in the US, at least in some parts of the US, the term stakeholders has been interpreted fairly broadly and it has brought more people into the conversation rather than narrowing the conversation. Um, but, that, but that may be context specific. Second thing, when you talk about building more dams and that sort of thing, that's a threshold decision in, in my taxonomy rather than a distributional decision. And I, I do think that threshold decisions are, are different and, and raise different kinds of um, uh, questions. And the third thing I would say about First Nations, actually, that's one of the places where we're now getting things right. The, the, at least for some of our tribes, of our Native American tribes, um, they have very senior water rights. And they've they've had those for more than 100 years. The Supreme Court has decided in, in the 1910s that that uh, at least where there were reservations or treaties that the, the Native Americans had these water rights. They didn't get practically recognized for a long time, but we're doing better about that now. And they are absolutely included as stakeholders anytime they have water rights. But I think they're actually also included as stakeholders, at least in these discussions, where they don't have quantified water rights, but they have clear cultural claims. So yes, you have to be very careful about getting those rights. And, and what I was thinking more, it seems to me that more of the problem we have is that people who are poor and not as well educated and work for jobs, they can't go to all these stakeholder meetings. And it's really easy for those kinds of processes to, as a practical matter, exclude people who have a real yeah. interest. And yes, absolutely, we have to be very careful about that. Thanks. Thanks, Gil. Um, anyone else with any questions for Holly? Holly, I see we have another comment in the chat box there from Linda Wilson. Yes. Um, would you like to respond to that one? I would like to respond to that. Um, I, I agree that stewardship of the resources matters and that that's, that may differentiate claims by different types of users, but I don't think that needs to be regarded as instead of equity. 
Um, maybe, maybe it's helpful to, to look at that differently, but I might say, you know, I, I don't think, again, one of the things I didn't say in my presentation, but I definitely see it here and in, in the rhetorical discussions around equity, it's really easy for equity to devolve to equal distribution among all the people who are making a claim. And actually you do see that in the fisheries context, people tend to say, oh, well, equal. Um, but it doesn't have to be, it can be fair to prioritize access to people who need more. It can be fair to prioritize access to people who will use the resource better in some sense that we're prepared to recognize. And absolutely, if people are ready to say, yeah, those who will use the resource better, it is fair to give them more. So I think that can be incorporated into the equity uh, analysis. Okay, excellent, thank you. Uh, are there any last questions for Holly? We're about five minutes away from the end of uh, the webinar. No? Okay, well, I think we can, oh wait, oh, saying, okay. Um, I think we could, uh... oh, hang on. John Johnson, sorry, I just yes, was about to close, but I'll pass over to you quickly. Okay, just a very quick one. Not so much about law, but uh, since you're a law professor, um, Prof. Holly, I uh, just thought what your views would be if I were to say that all environmental lawyers and law students should study beyond law. Uh, things oh, yeah. like uh, holistic management, you know, by the likes of Ellen Savory, with, because without that comprehensive view of the world that we live in and how we relate to everything else and without that holistic context, the stakeholders, as Gil mentioned, just becomes, you know, humans. Uh, the other uh -huh. species don't, yeah, so maybe you could say something about that. I, I guess, yes, I, I would absolutely agree. And I would take this well beyond the context of environmental lawyers. Any lawyer who doesn't know anything other than law is going to be a terrible lawyer, right? I mean, law, law just doesn't do everything. Um, it's, a, it's a system for resolving conflicts, but you have to know something about the context in which those conflicts are being uh, played out. So um, absolutely. And, and I think I'm sure you could get a range of views about what should be the on the reading list of everybody. And, and you know, this probably is a systematic failure, failure of law schools is that we end up so, at least in the US, we end up so focused on teaching our students how to do the law part of it, that there isn't always time in our classes for the background that there ought to be. But yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, I think I think Johnson for just for information, Holly uh, does have a, a PhD in plant biology before teaching the law school. So I mean, so she's that type of environmental law professor with a very strong science background. But uh, there is this last last minute question. Uh, yeah. Paul, to what extent can the principle of equity be applied to areas beyond national jurisdiction? So I take it. Um, Sarah, this is a question about the current UN negotiations uh, where they're trying to get a treaty um, uh, uh, governing biodiversity conservation in, well, biodiversity in areas outside of any national jurisdiction, so the high seas. Um, can, I think principles of equity need to be applied there. Um, it's interesting, you know, I, to me, I, I'm so confused by what I've seen of the negotiations of the ABNJ treaty, because it's so focused on things I'm like, well, that's not the key, that's not what's really important here. It's been this whole sideshow about environmental assessment, you know, that I'm like, yeah, okay, but how are we going to divvy up these resources? And then there's this whole thing about the genetic resources. Um, which obviously they're important to a lot of stakeholders, people care, but 
if you don't have fish, you don't have genetic resources either. <laughs> and it seems to me they've really alighted the what do we do about the fish? And yes, I think maybe, maybe the reason that's been alighted is that we do have regional fishery management organizations who actually do um, regulate, govern, uh, fishing for particular species, at least, in some parts of a high sea. So it's not true that high seas fishing is completely unregulated. But I think absolutely equity ought to be part of this. And um, in a way that, well, UNCLOS, had the, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, specifically invokes uh, equity with the, the um, seabed, right, in the in areas beyond national jurisdiction. I think it would make sense to do that as well um, for the high seas. But of course, on the seabed, we haven't yet gotten to figuring out what will be equitable. And that's surely not going to be an, an easy thing to arrive at. Thanks, Holly. And thank you. Um, the question from Afghanistan uh, Pataya or Patia. Um, thanks for that question as well. Um, okay, so that brings us to the end of um, this month's Law and Nature Dialogue webinar. Um, please join me as best you can in the Zoom universe to thank Professor Holly Doremus once again for a fascinating uh, discussion, a fascinating talk. Thank you as well to um, everyone who, who contributed the questions as well, which really enriches the discussion also. And I see, Holly, you have some offers of collaboration in the chat group as well. So the oh, law and great. nature dialogue is the gift that keeps on giving. Um, okay. So <laughs> thank you everyone. And um, please tune in next month, September for our next installment of the webinar. Okay, thanks everyone and, and uh, bye for now. Thank you, Holly, bye. Thank you.